Uh, at the risk of softening the, uh, the hard edge of this debate, which is, as I understand, that is community possible in an age of globalization, uh, I would like to answer that question both in the negative and in the affirmative. On the negative side, it is my firm belief that if we continue to go on our present approach, which I think is an ideologically driven, one-size-fits-all obsession with globalization for its own sake, then community, which I define as a place not only where we live and consume, but where we produce and make decisions that influence our futures, is dead. You cannot have community coexist with an obsessive, single-minded focus on globalization for its own sake. On the other hand, if we recognize that while some of the elements of the next economy properly lend themselves to globalization, many others don't. And if we develop a framework that acknowledges that the new technological and environmental dynamic offers us the opportunity to satisfy the almost universal yearnings for democracy, stability, security, and a sense of place while still encouraging innovation and competition and productivity, then we can nurture strong communities. And it's possible to do so even in a world that becomes ever more interconnected. Unfortunately, right now, we're on the first path. The overriding goal of public policy today at all levels is to facilitate the movement of ever greater quantities of resources over ever longer distances at ever greater speeds. Albert Einstein once said, perfection of means and confusion of ends seems to characterize our age. And I think that our obsession with mobility, with transportation, with globalization is an indication of that. Indeed, globalism, like all isms, is more like a religion than it is a judgment. And its conclusions are more often required to be taken on faith than to be questioned. And like all religions, it has its own catechism. And its own catechism is exports are better than selling domestically, absentee ownership is better than local ownership, giantism is better than humanly scaled institutions, and mobility is to be favored over community. And of course, those who question its tenets are branded heretics. But it's 1997, and so we're not burned at the stake. Uh, we are just not invited into the room because we are petty, and we are parochial, and we are small-minded, uh, and we want to turn history uh, backwards. Uh, and so we are not invited uh, to the table. The central core of globalism is separation. The central feature of globalization is separation. We've designed rules that separate the producer from the consumer, that separate the farmer from the kitchen, that separate the power plant from the appliance, that separate the borrower and the depositor from the banker, and, and, and ultimately separate the government from its citizenry. That is, we have designed rules. We've encouraged the separation of those who make the decisions from those who feel the impact of those decisions. Uh, we have separated authority uh, and responsibility, and we have deemed that good and beneficial. But of course, ultimately, if you strip people of their ability to participate in the decisions that affect their future, if you strip communities and towns of power and independence, ultimately you breed <laughs> passivity, you breed alienation, uh, you breed an abdication of personal and collective responsibility, and ultimately I think you breed anger and even violence. And so if, in fact, globalization does undermine strong, coherent geographical communities, if it does separate those who make the decisions from those who feel the impact of the decisions, if it does rely on physical transportation systems and begin to undermine our sense of self-confidence and our ability uh, to self-govern, then it would seem reasonable to demand that the burden of proof be on those who would argue for globalization and not those who would argue against it. But of course, the, the, the opposite uh, is true. Uh, if we take a look 
at the question, which is a very simple question, is globalization economical? We find that there's very little empirical evidence that would indicate that it is. Now, mind you, I didn't say is globalization profitable to those who are involved in it, but is it economical, even on their terms? I want to say their terms, even on the narrow terms of does it promote faster and more balanced uh, economic growth? Um, it, it's remarkable how little empirical evidence there is. Uh, Paul Krugman, who's a well-known prize-winning uh, economist, uh, points out that the idea that a country's economic fortunes are largely determined by its success on world markets is a hypothesis, not a truism. And, and I quote, as a practical empirical matter, the hypothesis is flat wrong. National living standards are overwhelmingly determined by domestic factors rather than by some competition for world markets. The fastest growth rates of virtually all countries in the world occurred in the 1950s, the 1960s, and the 1970s, and that was during the era that governments were given a great deal of authority to protect family farms, to protect small businesses, to protect the environment, and to protect their domestic uh, industries. In the middle 1980s, I became uh, heavily involved in the free trade issue. Uh, when I looked at the uh, debate going on, although there was a modest debate to be true, but the debate going on in Europe around the single Europe uh, treaty. And I uh, sent for and received a two-volume work, which was interestingly titled The Costs of Non-Europe. Uh, two volumes, more than 2,000 pages. And I was struck by how in those thousand, by two things. In those 2,000 pages, there was nothing on the other side of the equation. There were only benefits of continentalization. There were no costs, not one. And even though there were no costs on that side of the equation, the benefits were trivial. The benefits were a fraction of a percent increase in the gross national product, itself a somewhat suspect indicator of progress, but a fraction of a percent increase in the gross national product over 10 years. Later on, we had the US-Canadian Free Trade Agreement debate, which is a very vigorous debate. And once again, by the proponents of the US-Canadian Free Trade Agreement, they uh, posited that there would be a fraction of a percent increase in economic growth if we opened up our borders. And then in the NAFTA debate, the North American Free Trade uh, Agreement, uh, we had a, a pitifully small benefit that was to be promised us, in return for which we were required to jettison much of our sovereignty and the purposes of our democracy. And it's fascinating how time and again, when the predictions of the globalists are confounded by real world events, that they point the finger not at free trade, but at, at some other event. It's a little like the dog ate my homework. Um, three years after NAFTA, our trade surplus with Mexico went from a modest surplus to a $14 billion deficit. Remember, they promised that it was going to go the other way around. And the Mexican economy imploded. Living standards plunged. A wave of drugs and violence swept the country and continues to do so. And the free traders kept the faith. In fact, they cried the Mexican government's devaluation of the peso caused all the problems, not NAFTA. In the 10 years after Europe embraced the single European free trade uh, agreement, unemployment doubled. And the reaction by free traders was, well, it's excessive government spending and inflexible labor markets that are at fault, and you just didn't go far enough. What you need is a single currency. Ever since 1974, when the President of the United States was given fast-track authority, which meant that uh, he basically could present an agreement to Congress and there could be no amendments, it was simply an up-and-down vote, so it made it easier to pass free trade agreements. Ever since 1974, uh, the real wages of the majority of Americans uh, have declined. Not the fault of the free trade agreement, obviously. It was the fault of the something or other. Uh, and so the empirical evidence is very weak. Uh, and even when the empirical evidence is strong on the other side, we find that there is a, no, uh, no acceptance of responsibility. Well, the lack of empirical evidence that absentee ownership and long distance trade benefits a community is matched by the abundant evidence of the costs of separation 
when we separate those who make the decisions from those who feel the impact of the decisions, when we separate authority from responsibility, when we undermine a locally owned productive capacity, bad things happen. In the early 1980s, we allowed savings and loan associations to invest any place they wanted. And in the middle 1980s, we allowed the banking community to merge and to concentrate its assets. Now, if you take a course in economics, Economics 101, and you talk about the benefits of bigness in the banking community, they would tell you that bigger banks are better than smaller banks for two reasons. One is that they don't put all of their assets in one basket. A smaller bank tends to lend locally, and communities can undergo a recession, whereas big banks can diversify their portfolios. It's a marvelous phrase, can diversify their portfolios. And therefore, if something happens over here, you still may be benefiting over there. And the second reason why big banks are better than small banks is that small banks all have their own board of directors. They have their own management structure. They have all their, over, their overhead structure. Whereas if you have one big bank, which owns many, many little banks and gets rid of all those board of directors, then you have much less uh, overhead, so you have a cheaper cost of doing business. It sounds eminently reasonable, and I'm sure that every student would answer right on the midterm examination. Turns out that in the real world, it doesn't work that way. Uh, in fact, when they looked at the savings and loan situation, they found out that those that went broke were those that didn't stick to their needing, in fact, diversified their portfolios and loaned to borrowers far from their communities. And those who did okay loaned to their neighbors. They found the same thing with banks. And, uh, and, and after the fact, when they found out that was true, they suddenly realized, well, it's true that when you're big, you get rid of all those board of directors, but it's also true that suddenly loans are approved far away from where they're given, and the people who approve the loans don't know the borrower, and the connection between the borrower and the banker gets uncoupled. And so any responsibility that the borrower might have to the banker and any knowledge that the banker has of the borrower disappears. And as a result, reasonably so, the default rate goes up. However, just a few days ago, the vice president of Nations Bank, I think it's our fourth largest bank now after its merger with uh, another bank, whose name I forget, uh, indicated that by the year 2000, there will be five giant banks in this country, and you will need $500 billion in assets in order to compete. Well, there's no empirical evidence that's driving that. But what's happened is that we created rules, or actually we discarded rules, 50 years old, 60 year old rules in this country, rules that created a community-based financial system in this country. We discarded them and we allowed this kind of orgy of concentration and of bigness uh, when in fact there was no empirical evidence uh, to justify it. You know in California probably better than any other part of the country, the costs of separating where people live from where they work, the cost of urban sprawl. And was it two years ago that the Bank of America quantified uh, those costs, those costs of a separation? We find out in this country that neighborhood schools work best. In fact, in Oklahoma City, uh, Oklahoma, the African American community, uh, which had gone through the integration era and had ended up with more segregation de facto than they previously had segregation de jure, decided that enough was enough, and they asked if they could have a segregated school, once again de facto, in a African American uh, neighborhood, and they were given permission in that neighborhood, the Longfellow School in that, in that uh, neighborhood, they found that uh, the test scores soared uh, after a couple of years. And when they asked the principal why that was so, the answer was not surprising to anybody who grew up with neighborhood schools. The answer was that the parents lived near the school. And we all know that parental involvement in their kids' education and with the school system itself is a primary determinant of their uh, test scores and their ability uh, to do well. When we separate the, the producer from the consumer, when we separate those who make the decisions from those who feel the impact of the decisions, we tend not only to weaken a sense of community, but we tend to end up with pretty lousy uh, 
uh, decisions. And one of the reasons we end up with lousy decisions is that the decision makers don't take into account the full cost of the impact of their decisions. Six months ago in Lima, Ohio, British Petroleum decided to close its 111-year-old oil refinery. Now, it might have been 111 years old, but it was a state-of-the-art oil refinery. In fact, in 1996, that oil refinery generated $45 million in profits to British Petroleum, but British Petroleum decided that it could make more profits with that investment elsewhere, and so it decided to close down the plant. Well, it was a very modern plant. It was a very profitable plant, and so five bidders came forward asking that they, for permission to buy the plant one of the bidders being the existing management of the plant. And British Petroleum decided not to sell the plant, but to shut it down because it didn't want someone else competing with it. 2,000 jobs will be lost and $100 million in income uh, or in, uh, in, uh, in economic activity will be lost in that small city uh, in Ohio. Clearly, that was the wrong decision to make for the community as a whole, for the nation as a whole. But we develop rules that allow that decision to be made by a source far away from the community. <clears throat> the strongest argument that tends to be made in favor of globalization is in fact not the economic argument, but the inevitability argument. That is that whatever one's feeling about globalization, it is inevitable, after all, hasn't the trend occurred for more than 100 years? The argument is made that, the techno that as technology changed at the end of the 19th century, as we shifted from wood to steel, as we shifted from wind and water power to concentrated energies of fossil fuels, when we shifted from cottage industry to mass manufacturing, we inevitably shifted from small to big, from local to national and global. And that argument is reasonable. But I think at the end of the 20th century, one can just as well argue that our technologies are moving us in the other direction, that we are shifting from steel to plastic, that we are shifting from fossil fuels back to renewable energy resources, although this time with very sophisticated technologies, that we are moving from mass manufacturing to flexible manufacturing, and in fact, the business community doesn't talk any longer about economies of scale, but they talk about economies of scope, uh, and their ideal now uh, is to be able to produce one unit of many items as cheaply as they could produce thousands of units of one item. And therefore, the technology allows us to move from big to little, from global to national, or to local. It's the rules that we make that will channel human ingenuity and investment capital and entrepreneurial energy in a certain direction. And so far, the rules that we have made move us toward globalization. I said at the beginning that I think that strong communities can survive in an age of globalization. And I think that's true if we recognize that economies are made up of different elements and they should be treated differently. Economists call these factors of production. They include raw materials, people, capital, information, and finished goods. Globalists put them all in the same pot. And they say, one size fits all. They should all be globalized. We should all uh, honor uh, mobility. Uh, we should all allow them uh, to move on a planetary scale, uh, except maybe for people. You know, there's sort of an inconsistency here with people. It's sort of uh, quite dramatic. Um, um, you know, last week or two weeks ago, we had the fast track vote. Uh, in Congress around the expansion of NAFTA, and I think 70% of the Republican Party uh, voted in favor of basically stripping us naked uh, in, uh, in, in the face of uh, planetary uh, economic forces, and so our businesses could move anywhere and capital could move anywhere and so forth. But at the same time, the Republican Party is very adamant about limiting immigration, right? Um, so the, the, the manufacturer can move from San Francisco to Tijuana, uh, and therefore the workers in San Francisco have to compete with the lower wages in Tijuana. That's acceptable because that increases productivity and makes us more efficient, but the people of Tijuana can't move to San Francisco and, and ask for wages that they would be getting in Tijuana because, well, because, because uh, it's... <laughs>
just, it's, it's an internal inconsistency there, but at least they realize that there are different factors of production and we need different rules related to those different factors of production. And I would argue uh, with you uh, and, and, uh, and before you uh, that if we examine the components of economies with a much more discerning eye, if we took into account the values that we hold dear, if we analyze the costs and the benefits in a comprehensive fashion, that we would fashion different rules for different economic factors. For example, from an environmental perspective, what we want to do is to minimize the consumption of raw materials and especially non-renewable materials. We want to reduce our dependence on physical transportation systems. We would require that sector to truly pay its own way. We would like to favor the regionalization and the localization of manufacturing. And we would favor local ownership over absentee ownership. What that means is that we would allow restrictions on the use of materials and the flow of materials that we would develop rules that would localize and regionalize productive capacity, and we would honor local ownership over absentee ownership. But when it comes to information, we would encourage globalization. Indeed, the one-size-fits-all policy that the free traders embrace, that the globalists embrace, uh, embrace, does in fact fit one factor of production. It's the factor of production that Steve uh, is involved in, uh, which is uh, information. And we should think about the future economy as, in fact, two economies, a dual economy, and use two metaphors to describe it, a global village and a globe of villages. We would minimize our reliance on physical transportation systems, we would miniaturize our physical production and extraction systems, and we would globalize our information systems. We would import a good idea, a good software program, a good piece of data, a good story, a good book from anywhere in the world. But we would produce the book, we would produce the physical product from that good design, uh, we would produce the software disk, if you will, uh, locally. If we did begin to bring together the globalization of information which connects us as a peoples uh, with the physical production from local materials uh, of our manufacturing system, then I believe that we can have the best of both possible worlds. We can nurture and defend a sense of community. We can allow people a sense of purpose. We can allow democracies to be healthful, uh, healthy and allow people to continue to exercise their right to create rules that protect their futures, while at the same time engendering and encouraging a sense of information that comes from the free, fl free flow of data, the free flow of ideas, and the free flow of information. Thank you. Thank you, David. Stephen?